Hello. Love Talk Radio. And we're live with our Hi. friends on uh, Facebook Live and the Vibe Radio Network. And I have Yuna under the couch who's about to attack my ankles. So. Of course she is. <laughs> of course she is. Because she's our burger muffin. Yep. But hope everybody's doing all right. Hope everybody is uh, not. Uh, Maybe dried out a little. Dried out. Maybe. Considering we just got another downpour. Yeah, we just finished that. Just finished it. And um, my ankle's getting attacked. Ah, so she's, yeah. she's here. Eunice here. Woohoo! Somebody else is losing blood besides me today. And she hasn't broken skin yet. Now, Eunice decided that mommy's like a bean pole and a good climbing post today. So, um, I have a lot of mix. She has no intention of coming out at the moment. No, of course not. She'll come out and make herself known in a few minutes. But she would like to know is everybody following her on Instagram? Yes, she because has her Instagram fuzzy murder muffin. Yes, Fuzzy Murder Muffin. Because she is one. She is. <laughs> but cheers to another week. Truly has some catitude, yes. Cheers to surviving the hurricane that was actually kind of a bust for us here in Richmond. Yes, followed then, by weeks of torrential downpours. Yeah. My yard is not dry yet. <laughs> Your garden's dead. Just about. Pretty much. It's going to be pulled next week because, mm. yeah. Mm. This is good, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually pretty good. We... we we, we bought something cheap <laughs> uh, at Wegmans. Yeah. Uh, it's a wine mojito. It's a Spanish white wine that's got mojito flavoring in it. It's very oh. lovely. It's like a nice minty, limey um, sangria almost. Which is kind of perfect for the... For tonight. For tonight. It, it's a very summery drink, which is goes hand in hand with the summer vacations that uh, go on down at the Outer mm. Banks. <laughs> Which one of our guides is at right now? One of our guides is at, and, uh, oh, um, can't forget uh, Ryan and Angie, uh, they're oh, yeah. our friends at the freaking awesome show, and... <laughs> <laughs> As you can see why we call her Murder Muffin. Here she is. Say hi, Yuna. Say hi. I will not say hi. <laughs> no, I will attack, because I'm on a Murder Muffin. <sighs> so. Yeah, she had a good long nap, and so she's ready to go in. She's been napping me. all day. <laughs> but we're going to talk about Outer Banks. We covered some of the uh, some stories from the Outer Banks with our ghostly ships and our last beaches um, topic. So we're going to you know try to hit some other ones that we haven't done before. Uh, but we'll still briefly you know maybe gloss over a few of those just to give you a quick reference point to other stories that we have found uh, while we've been um, doing the research for this. So, we're going to start with the uh, Currituck Lighthouse. Um, we went to this one, right? Was this the one, Duck? Yes. Or, no, that was the Corolla Lighthouse. Corolla. Wait. Currituck. Yeah. Right. We have not been to Currituck. Yes. That's okay. the only one we haven't been to. Yeah, it's been. A, we did a whole bunch of lighthouses and we missed one, so apparently it was this one. Um, so, there were a number of uh, unfortunate events that happened in the north room of the Keeper's House. Uh, at the Currituck Beach Lighthouse, and um, they all seem to have started uh, back with one of the original keepers, and it just got worse from that point onwards, uh, to the point that when um, the 1940s came around, that's when the ghost story started to come out about the Keeper's Lighthouse, uh, and it was in the 80s that it was actually restored, and you can now visit it. Um, but... Um, the story starts back with young Sadie Johnson and her family. Uh, this, As I said, it was the first uh, keeper to live in the lighthouse. Uh, she lived with her aunt and her uncle. She actually called them father and mother because her parents died while she was very young. And so this is the only father and mother that she ever had, uh, that she remembers. Um, he was the keeper. His wife uh, kept the area, grew gardens, um, tended to the, the land and to the, the facilities. Uh, alongside her husband and Sadie was an only child to them so often she went off and went and played by herself uh, and this included going down to the beach to build sand castles every single day because you're at the beach what do you do you play in the sand that's what Sadie did she occasionally would play with the, the other children but they were few and far in, in between and so she often had to rely on herself for entertainment so every day she went down there she had been warned constantly by both her aunt and her uncle never to play close to the shore never to turn her back on the ocean because she was such a small thing and they didn't want her to get washed out to sea. Uh, unfortunately, Sadie didn't always listen. She didn't always remember her promises to not be close to the ocean. 
And so when she would go down there, she would build sand castles literally until the waves would rise up with a high tide and wash her sand castle away. And she often would be in danger. Pausing for a second because we have a cord muncher. Um, <laughs> um, come here, you. All right. <laughs> Help mommy tell a story. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> She's not a lap kitty yet. Anyway, so Sadie went, went down to the shore one day, as was her daily routine. She started building her sandcastle, and she had her back turned to the water. She was concentrating on the very last tower, which was the tallest and the hardest one to construct, and all of her focus was on that tower. She didn't hear the fishermen calling to each other, warning that there was a high tide starting to come in. And luckily, one of those fishermen actually happened to notice that she hadn't been paying attention. So he watched her for a minute thinking, well, maybe she'll pay attention as the water rushes up over her shoes and onto her castle splashing up on her dress. She at that point in time turned to the water and started scolding the waves. She actually thought she could push the waves back with a good scolding. Uh, when he saw the next wave starting to come back up, she actually had turned her back again on the ocean and started to rebuild that tower because she wanted it to be finished before she went home. And he ran over to her and pulled her out of the way of the wave and uh, basically scolded her again, telling her never, never, never turn your back on the waves because they'll just drag you out to sea. And then told her that she was going to be brought home and um, spoken to her father about her actions. So she went with him and she didn't think she was going to get much of any sort of um, punishment because her father uncle uh, couldn't ever hold a grudge against her. He just loved her that much and could never be a, a strict father with her. Uh, so again, went back to the lighthouse. A uh, fisherman informed him, George was his name, of what had happened and George promised that he would talk to Sadie about this and uh, make sure that she's punished. After the fisherman left, George took uh, Sadie in. He did scold her and he chided her for letting her dress get uh, wet and dirty because cloth and clothes were not easily um, something that you get to the island at that point in time. We didn't have the bridge that we have today. And um, she said yes, Father, very quietly and meekly and promptly forgot her promise never. We promised antics. Never to uh, turn her back on the... Um, the ocean again and of course the next day when she goes out she forgets this promise and she plays too close unfortunately this time there are no fishermen out there to warn her or to pull her away when the uh, water starts coming in in high tide and Sadie disappears she doesn't come home when she doesn't come home they send out a search party uh, everybody basically knowing that she's been pulled out to sea um, and they do search but they never find her it's a couple of days later when her body actually washes up on the Virginia shore and it's brought back down to Kiritak uh, they of course wake her uh, waking at that point in time was a three day period because they wanted to make sure that you wouldn't wake up from a coma before you were buried so that's where the term wake comes from or awake and, uh, of course, everybody knew that she was good and dead, um, that the sea had done its job uh, and basically ruined her body, and it was, I won't get into any more of that. <laughs> Not tasty. No, sadly. Yeah. Uh, so she was brought back to Virginia, and she was buried in the family plot, uh, and since then, the North Room has always had this very sad, cold feeling about it, uh, and people never stayed in there again if they were part of the Johnson family. Um... After that, another keeper, whose name has been um, lost to time, he and his wife come into um, the, uh, the keeper's quarters, and uh, unfortunately, she is not able to keep up her end of the duties because she has fallen ill with tuberculosis. At this point in time, tuberculosis has no treatment, and uh, basically they just try to tend to the person who has contracted it, making them as comfortable as possible until they slowly pass on. A uh, very nasty way to go. Sadly. Very sadly. Um, was the way things were. It was. Uh, luckily we have a treatment for it today. But uh, she basically is secluded in that north room with her books, with her clothing, and uh, she's brought food every single day. Uh, they bring the food up, they leave it outside the door, they knock on the door. She waits and counts until uh, she hears the footsteps 
proceed down the stairs and then she goes and opens the door, brings her food in again. They didn't want to pass on the disease if they could avoid it. Uh, and then she dies alone in that room. Uh, she, when she dies alone, she is very quickly buried. No wake this time because again, they were afraid of the disease and they didn't want it to be passed on. All of her belongings are sealed inside of a barrel uh, and it's left in that room and nobody goes in that room again. Uh, it's not until the 1940s uh, when the lighthouse has already been decommissioned. It, it's running automatically at this point in time. No keepers have lived there, but the children use the grounds, especially the courtyard area, to play hide and seek. And so a group of children are in the courtyard area playing hide and seek, and they all hear a little girl's voice coming from the keeper's quarters saying, Come play with me. Come play with me. And they have been told for decades, everybody in this neighborhood, do not go into the keepers because everybody was still afraid of the tuberculosis possibly breaking out from there. And um, they were definitely told not to go in the north room. Well, they follow the voice. She's climbing. <laughs> they follow the voice of the child up to that north room. They open it up and uh, they look around the room. They're curious, where was this voice? This, this room's been shut up for quite a while at this point. Uh, they discover the barrel there and they actually open it up and they find the uh, old light keeper's wife's clothes and they play dress up in her old clothes. The adults come into the house looking for them and they are horrified by this macabre uh, version of house that the kids have started to play in their dressed up clothes. And they make them strip down, including all of their clothes. They immediately burn everything right then and there out in the courtyard, including the barrel. And uh, at that point in time, the house is sealed up again until the 1980s and that's when renovations take place. When the renovations are going on, the volunteers who are there helping always said that there was a very cold, uh, uneasy feeling when they were in the north room cleaning it out, uh, bringing it up to date, and yes, they did hear the, come play with me, come play with me. So I'd be very curious if anybody ever gets a chance to go into the house today and tour it, um, or even do an investigation there, if they would catch an EVP of the, come play with me. And play with me. Steve, we need to do a road trip. Oh darn, I'm sure he's okay. broken hearted. <laughs> or a twisted road trip. Everybody in the twisted group likes a good beach trip. Any comments? A lot of people saying hi. Okay, Alex, I gotta go, Julia. We got cows, all in quotes. I, I, do you, what am I, my... oh, the cows from Twister. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. Got it. <laughs> yes. Got it. Alex was on a paranormal investigation yeah, with us. Right. Yes. Um, two weeks ago? A week ago. Just over a week ago. Yeah. It seems like an eternity <laughs> it ago. It does. Um, so she was up at Scott's show in Hanover Tavern with us. She was part of our group, and it was really cool to meet her. And um, yeah, we, we made a reference to Twister and the cow line. <laughs> at oh, that point. Oh, she deleted the comment, apparently. Uh, I was going to laugh at it, but I can't. Oh, no. Fa Facebook. Oh, deleted. Oh. But it was a fun fun little it was inside fun. joke. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's switch. Okay. Switching cool. seats. So I can go after her, maybe? Yes, and you can keep my other comments, too. Okay, cool. So, because this next this next story is going to be our longest one to be evening. It is. Um, it is a legend. Um, it is one of the oldest legends of the Roanoke Islands. So, uh, we didn't include it last time because it is so long. But since we're focusing solely on the Outer Banks, yeah, we decided we would include it. Because it's a fascinating tale. It is. And, of course, it does have to do with the Lost Colony. Because, well... The Lost Colony, the Outer Banks, it's kind of... It's hand in hand. It goes hand in hand. And uh, if you don't know too much about the Lost Colony, well, well, we'll give you this little bit of background. So, in 1584, Sir Walter Raleigh commissioned an exploration team to the Outer Banks off the coast of what is today North Carolina. They returned to England reporting that they had found a suitable place to establish a colony. A party was put together of 117 men, women, and children, including Governor John White and his daughter, Eleanor Dare. Dare, Dare County, just in case you ever wondered where that name came from. So, 
They set sail aboard the Elizabeth II for the New World in Roanoke Island. However, what they didn't know is that they would sail into history as the Lost Colony of Roanoke. The Lost Colony has fascinated people for centuries, and no one has been able to prove with concrete evidence what exactly happened to the colony. How the legend of what may have happened endures to this day. Now, come to the modern day. Mark Daniels is a very famous, uh, well, very, maybe not famous, but he's a well-to-do vineyard horticulturist. Horticulturalist. Big words. And was brought to Roanoke Island one day because the most famous grapevine in all of North Carolina was in trouble. This famous vine is the mother vineyard, a variety of grape known as scuppernog, which is sweet on the inside, dry on the outside, and grows like a weed. In fact, the only thing that can kill it is weed killer, and this is why Mark was brought in. Someone clearing power lines took the vine climbing trellis on Mother Vineyard Road as a large overgrown weed and sprayed it with herbicide. Unknowingly, they almost killed the oldest planted vine in the United States. The vine was supposedly planted by the lost colony settlers, but there is another possible legend for this origin story. Mark knew the story, but thought more likely it had been planted by a native tribe. No matter how it came to be, it was Mark's job to get it healthy again. He dug down into the dry, crumbly, and sandy soil, creating a well hole that exposed the vine roots. Then he flushed the roots with fresh water, cleaning them of any remaining poison. As he watched material around the roots rise in the water, something strange caught his attention. It was a thin shaft of wood with a shark's tooth as an arrow tip. As he pulled the item from the water, he confirmed it was a shark's tooth tip, and he thought that was out of place. He took the arrow shaft to the homeowner to make sure it didn't belong to one of his children, and when the homeowner was impressed with the arrow and confirmed that it wasn't a toy and it certainly didn't belong to any of his children, um, uh, he also managed to confirm that the local tribes that had inhabited the area in years prior used stone, typically, for their arrow tips. He suggested that Mark take the arrow to the local historian, Tommy Blevins, as he was familiar with the na native tribe's history and lore. Mark paid a visit to the old historian, and Tommy took one look at the arrow shaft and asked Mark if he was familiar with the legend of the White Doe. Mark had not heard the tale, and Tommy proceeded to tell the tale with a warning that Mark would be surprised by his find at Mother Vineyard. Now, many know, many know of the Lost Colony, or have at least heard of it, along with the first English baby born in the New World, Virginia Dare. The colony disappeared during the three years it took Governor John White to return with supplies. History tells us the colony gave up and moved to Hatteras, however the legend tells much more. Long story, need to wet the palace. Yes. <laughs> the colon... <coughs> Excuse me. Wrong pipe. <laughs> Figures. <clears throat> the colonists were known by two tribes in the vicinity of the Lost Colony. The first was led by the friendly Chief Mantio, who had been baptized three days before Virginia Dare. The second tribe was led by the hateful Chief Juan... Juan... Juan Yes. Juan Chez. There's a town named that. I don't yes, know and, and, and Manteo, for that and matter, Manteo. as well. Yeah. So there are actually two towns on the island, and that was the name of these two um, tribe chiefs. Manteo would often trade with the colonists and offer some protection to them. However, it was on a day that Chief Manteo had gone on a fishing trip for his village that the warriors of the Chief Wanches attacked the col colony village, burning it and forcing the survivors to flee to the fort. Once inside, they fought back against the attacking tribe. When Manteo heard of the attack, he rushed to the fort and entered through a secret tunnel. He urged the colonists to flee with him, and on the way out of the tunnel, Virginia Dare's father stopped to carve in a tree where they were going so Governor White would know where to look when he returned. Unfortunately, he was shot in the back with an arrow from the attacking tribe and only was able to carve C-R-O before falling to the ground, mortally wounded. Virginia's mother fell down, grieving on top of him. Manteo tried to pull her away to escape, but she refused. It was only after he reminded her that she needed to live for her daughter and that he promised to protect them both for the rest of his life that she reluctantly ran with him, holding Virginia in her arms. Safe within the tribe, the colonists were accepted. The tribe taught them to farm, hunt, and to build shelters in their traditional way. The colonists taught the tribe how to build two-story structures, how to operate firearms, and make other weapons, etc. 
Virginia Dare grew up with, within the tribe that, and became a beautiful young woman with blonde hair and blue eyes. She was such a rare beauty that the tribe and many others around wished to worship her as a goddess. She always discouraged such attempts, and many sought her out for her wisdom, and she always had time for every tribesman. She also became the object of affection for many men. She was shy when it came to men, and never felt a connection to any of the ones who sought her as a mate. Two men, however, thought that they could be the ones to win her hand. The first was o Okisko, the bravest, strongest, and most dependable man within the tribe. Virginia refused his offer of marriage, but this didn't deter Okisko. He was a patient man and vowed to show her with every action his love for her. The second man to fall wildly in love with Virginia was Old Chico, a witch doctor or shaman from an inland village. Old Chico was not willing to wait or try to persuade Virginia that he loved her. He had decided that if he could not have her, then no one would have her. He only saw Virginia as a rare and beautiful possession. Chico took to working his dark magic. He gathered dark magic pearls from mussels, and these were tiny pied or spot, spotted pearls that had the souls of evil water nymphs in them. They had been cursed into the pearls by the gods of the waters after they, they had angered him, and they were willing to do anything to be released. This is what Chico used to weave his spell. He whispered his demands to each pearl before stringing it onto a necklace. As the water nymph agreed to the terms, the pearl grew luminescent with an otherworldly glow. Chico took the necklace with him when he sailed over to Hatteras on his new canoe. He sought out Virginia and offered her the first ride in it. She was honored and not sure how to turn him down. To get her to agree, Chico told her he would only take her on a short trip to Roanoke Island where she was born. Virginia agreed and stepped into the canoe. When they moved close to Roanoke Island, Chico then presented Virginia with a pearl necklace. She politely took it, knowing she would never keep it. She examined the lumin and then she examined the luminescent pearls. Chico insisted that she wear it as she stepped out of the canoe and Virginia complied. She was starting to get a little wary of Chico as his tone and demeanor had changed. Quickly, she moved to get out of the canoe and away from him, and as soon as both of Virginia's feet hit the land, she was she left the dominion of the god of the waters and the evil water nymphs within the pearls were able to work their magic. Virginia transformed from a lovely young woman into a graceful white doe with hair as soft as spun silk. She ran off into the forest. Chico, with his evil work done, paddled back to his inland village alone. Virginia had told no one where she was going and with whom. She soon was missed and a search party was sent out to no avail. Chico was questioned as he had been seen in the village on the day that she had disappeared, but Chico professed innocence, but Okisko suspected otherwise. Shortly after the disappearance, people started to report sightings of a white doe. While most did not see a connection, Okisko put the two together and saw evil magic at play. The doe was hunted by the tribesmen for her pelt, but no arrow would harm the doe. When a hunting party would spot her, she would look forlornly at them before running off into the forest. Certain that the white doe was Virginia, Okisko sought his own magical counter to the spell she was under. He sought out the great shaman Winod Winodin, Winodin, who was... <laughs> who you even had a pronunciation key there. <laughs> Winodin, Winodin, who was an open rival to old Chico. He hated Chico for the many evils he had unleashed on the land. Winodin was more than happy to help Okisko, and he instructed Okisko on how to break the spell. First, Okisko must catch a shark, pull one of its largest teeth, and then release the shark back into the water. Then he needed to affix three pearls to the points of the shark's tooth so that it would, that it would cut the spell, but not harm the doe. Sound familiar? The arrowhead then needed to be attached to a branch of wood that had never before been used as an arrow. For the final component, Okisko must catch a heron, pluck a feather, release the heron, and then use that feather as fletching for the arrow. Then the most important part, Okisko had to take the arrow to the magic spring on Roanoke Island where the good nymphs gathered to celebrate and dance. They kept the spring enchanted with magic fresh water to preserve its goodness. Okisko needed to leave the arrow in the spring for three days and nights before the full moon. While he waited, he must keep the nymphs away. On the end of the third day, he was to remove the arrow from the water and ask the spirits to remove the curse. 
Okisko returned home to undertake the task to return his love to her former human form. It took almost a month to complete his task. Unbeknownst to him, the son of Wanchise had become chief of his tribe and had called a meeting of the tribes to discuss peace. He was tired of the fighting and wanted the tribes to work together. At the end of the meeting, he proposed a group hunt and the target was the White Doe. Secretly, the new chief wanted to take this prize himself and use it to make himself the chief of all the tribes. Not so indifferent from his father. To kill the White Doe, he would use a silver arrowhead given to his father by Queen Elizabeth I. If any arrow could kill the White Doe, that would be the one. The day of the hunt came, and both Okisko and Wanchese hunted the same creature to different ends. Okisko to return life, and Wanchese to take life. Finally, they both found the doe, one on the opposite side of the other, yet not able to see each other through the thick Roanoke forest. Okisko saw the doe and quickly raised his bow, silently praying the spirits to guide his arrow. Wanchese did the same, but his thoughts were only for himself. Okisko's arrow flew first, followed closely by Wanchese's arrow. Okisko saw the arrow strike the doe, but not penetrate the doe. And Virginia Dare was immediately returned to her human form. Then Wanchese's arrow struck her through the heart. Wanchese was stunned and in terror of what he had done. He surely thought that he had shot the white doe, but saw a woman fall. He ran away in fear and cowardice. He had killed someone innocent and would never be the great leader he wished to be with that act. Okisko ran towards his beloved and found her dead on the ground with his arrow next to her and a silver arrow in her heart. Okisko's heart was crushed, but he was undaunted and would not let her die in vain. He grabbed his arrow and ran to the magical spring and collapsed. On his knees, he plunged the arrow into the bubbling water and asked the spirits for one more deed. His words were no sooner spoken than the spring began to dry up, collapsing around the arrow. The shaft took root and sprigs of leaves began to grow from the wood. Before Okisko's eyes, a vine grew up and out of the spring. It burgeoned into a canopy, sheltering him from the last sun of the day. Okisko rested until he had enough strength to return to his beloved. When he made it back to the forest where Virginia had fallen, he found Virginia's body to be gone. As the sun set, Okisko saw a flash of white out of the corner of his eye. A small white doe ran, stopped, looked at him, and then disappeared into the forest. Okisko's wish had been granted. He was saddened to lose his beloved, but happy she had been immortalized as the White Doe of Roanoke Island. From that day forth, the doe has been seen running in the woods and was never hunted again by the tribes. In fact, they fear the repercussions of even trying to take such a sacred animal. As Tommy finished his tale, Mark sat enraptured by the story. Tommy did caution that the arrow Mark had found may not be the magical arrow that Okisko had made, but the motherland vine grew from that arrow. Any remains would have rotted away by now, Mark thought, but it would make a good souvenir from his work on the island. Mark continued to care and tend the motherland vine, and while he worked, he would hear rustling of an animal in the woods behind him. He liked to think a certain white doe was watching him tend to Okisko's legend and legacy. After he had flushed the roots one last time and filled in the well with fresh, rich, well-draining soil, he had finished his work. The next day, as he was leaving the island, he stopped to check the vine once more. He found the vine green and vibrant and noticed some of the vines had been pulled on with leaves missing. Upon closer inspection, he saw in the soft ground the hoof prints of a small deer. And that is the story of the white doe of Roanoke Island. And there's still a ton of wild deer out in the Outer Banks and on Roanoke Island, and they're always very, very vigilant to look for a white deer. It actually makes the newspapers anytime somebody sees an albino deer out there. Um, they like to call, it's Virginia. We need to get to Roanoke again. Yeah, we do. We only took like an afternoon trip there once. We did. We saw the gorgeous Elizabethan Gardens. We wanted to do the show, but of course it was pre their season, yeah, so it was, we couldn't go. And not much going on there this year. Yeah. But. So we will plan another trip where we can actually go and stay, and we are going to try to look at this next location. Okay. If we can for a night. Hopefully. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so this is the Roanoke Island Inn. Are we switching again? 
She's asleep. I'm meant for the keyboard. Oh, okay. Did you type anything? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. I got so enraptured in telling the story. Okay, we gotta not keep doing dozy dozy. Okay, all right, fine. <laughs> but she's sound asleep on the bookshelf. Uh, no, she's not. She's pretending to be sound asleep on the bookshelf. Anyway, uh, so the Roanoke Island Inns, the next two are going to be really short, just so you know. Uh, this was constructed in the 1860s by Asa Jones and his wife, Martha. The Roanoke Inn is a quaint little bed and breakfast overlooking the sea, <clears throat> excuse me, scenic Roanoke Marsh, Marsh's lighthouse and the surrounding landscape. Now, it's owned by John Wilson, the great-grandson of Asa, Asa Jones, and it has more than doubled in size from the original structure. What could be so scary about this well-maintained inn with a great location? Well, it says that the ghost of Roscoe Jones, the former owner of the inn and member of the Wilson family, haunts the Roanoke Island Inn. Roscoe was the postmaster in the town of Manateo for many years, up until he received notice that he had been let go by the U.S. Postal Service. Feeling extremely humiliated, Roscoe shut off from the outside world and wouldn't leave his room in the inn unless no one else was in the building at the time. Shortly after losing his job and isolating himself, Roscoe passed away. Not long after his death, the ghost of a man in a postal uniform was spotted leaving and entering the front door of the building on a fairly regular basis. In addition to the ghost of Roscoe haunting the building, guests have reported hearing mysterious footsteps walking back in and forth upstairs, vases are mysteriously smashed onto the floor, blinds move up and down, and the radios will turn on and off on their own. So I definitely think this is a good place for us to start our haunted uh, beach trip. I'm game. <laughs> so, remember that. Roanoke Island Inn. That other place in Manateo uh, is the Pioneer Theater. This was built in eight, uh, 1918 and was moved to its current location in 1937. Now, there's no question that the Pioneer Theater is a landmark structure on Roanoke Island. George W. Creef Jr. opened the original movie house and it remains in operation with the original family after all of these years. The theater broadcasts the same movie at least once a night a week and 12 months out of the year. The single screen family friendly theater is a small town gem. There are no R rated movies here shown and admission is only $5 at the time the article was written. Uh, the most expensive concession item is $1. Again, when the article was written. Yeah. I can't so. have one dollar concessions. I can't even wrap my mind around that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, some Roanoke Island locals believe that old movie theater is haunted by a former family member who owned the business and continues to watch over the place, demanding people be respectful of one another. Cell phones are absolutely not allowed. In fact, if you pull out your cell phone, the ghost will knock your phone out of your hand, if, and if you try to use it, don't expect your cell phone to survive. Smashy, smashy. Smashy, smashy. I'm not going to risk my cell phone just to find out if that works. Mm -mm. But I'll break all their equipment. <laughs> Do a little impromptu hunt? Yeah. Take our K2. Yep. Something subtle. K2, maybe an EVP recorder. I don't think the dowsing rods will be subtle. No. <laughs> Nothing subtle about dowsing rods. <laughs> anyway. So, Bodie Island. Bodie Island Lighthouse. This one we have been to. We didn't get up into it because it was still closed, but we got there to take pictures. That's the one that we I, I used that for the, the cover photo on the event. It's a very pretty one. It's a very, it was, yeah. I took a gorgeous picture and I, I, I took a, took some Photoshop um, liberties with it. Yeah, when we go back, we will actually try to go when it's actually open. We were there the day before it opened up. Bad timing. Yeah, just off. Well, it was the end of April. Yeah, it was the end of April when we went, and that's when I had spring break, so that's when we went. Oh, gosh. Yeah, maybe early April. Mm -hmm. Either way. And it was when my parents could make it down, because we went down with them. That's been the last time we were down there for a vacation, wasn't it? Yeah. It's been a long time. It's been a while. But we treated them because his mommy wanted to go see the ponies. Yes. We did see the ponies, though. We saw them in Opal Coke. That's true, we did. What we no 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 no. Oh no, that was our first trip down. Yes. Yeah, no we didn't. We didn't take my parents out to Oak Grove. We went as far as Hatteras. Oh well. Yeah. My bad. They still had a good trip. We all they had did. a good trip. They enjoyed themselves. Yes. Alright, anyways. Moving on. Bodie Island Lighthouse. <laughs> anyways, yes. So 
With the nature of lighthouses and the long isolation of the keepers and their families, it's not surprising that so many of lighthouses end up haunted by the keepers long after they have passed on. Bodie Island Light was first built in 1847, but fell over soon after. A, re yeah. <laughs> A replacement light stood for only two years before it was brought down by the Confederate soldiers who did not want to see the light used by Union troops as an observation post. Then, the current lighthouse that is still there today was Third built. Charm. Third time's charm. Third time's charm. This says, yep. It was built in 1872, far from the shoreline and set along the sound and marshes. The keepers manned the light until 1940, when it was then automated. There is one ghostly legend that many people have heard about Bodie Island Light regarding a peculiar knocking sound that takes place every day in the keepers' quarters. The knocking seems to emerge from a sealed up fireplace. The odd thing about this phenomenon is that there does not seem to be a tale or story behind it, and no one working at the site will actually say if they've heard it. It's kind of... It's just somebody started this story a long time ago, but nobody can verify it. Yeah. It's really weird. But but it's spread like wildfire. It's yeah. like one thing that people are like, oh yeah, have you heard the knocking? Like, the, no. No, but apparently everybody knows about the knocking. Yeah. So, anyways, but... Urban legend. Urban legend. Possibly urban legend, yep. Then there is the story, however. There is one story that an employee at the lighthouse was willing to share. <clears throat> Lauren Gaskill, an employee in the gift shop, was well-versed in the stories and history of the lighthouse. Her job has her surrounded by books on the subject day in and day out. She admits the favorite part of her day is when she gets to see the light of the lighthouse wink on in the early evening. Her job consists of ringing up purchasers for customers all day long. Then, when the shop closes, oh, she balances the register and restocks for the next day. One day, at closing, the register started going crazy, according to Lauren. She was several feet away when it started to ring up items, but it was, um, uh, but, uh, but, oh, but, but she was the only one in the shop. Sorry. Uh, she looked at the register screen to see if it was a sale that had gotten caught up in the memory of the computer, but it wasn't. It just kept ringing up random prices and spewing out a receipt that kept getting longer and longer. Big CVS receipt. <clears throat> Very good comparison. <laughs> Lauren finally shut down the machine, thinking it was some electronic glitch and that a reboot would fix it. While letting the machine work through its issues, she went upstairs to gather the needed items for restocking the shop. The upstairs is often empty of people as it is used for little more than storage for books and a few items for the park service. The rangers came up there less than she did, and they had already closed up their counter and doors and were done in the upstairs for the day. There was one ranger still on property, but they were making sure that the last visitors left the site safely. Lauren gathered the items she needed, then she went downstairs making sure the door to the dusty upstairs was closed behind her when she left. Once she was back in the shop, she set, she set down the items and started organizing them. That was when she heard a quiet thump. From upstairs. It barely registered in her mind, but when a second thump happened, her full attention turned to the noises from the vacant space above her. She was absolutely certain that she was the only person in the building. The thumps seemed to organize themselves and then turned into clearly recognizable heavy footsteps. Then the footsteps moved in the direction of the door at the top of the stairs. Lauren decided restocking could wait until tomorrow. She grabbed her keys and purse and locked up for the night. She made a note to come in late the next day just to make sure that somebody else would be in the building with her. Well, someone who was supposed to be there, at least. When Lauren arrived the next day, she was able to finish restocking. Then she had one of the rangers go upstairs with her. All the doors were still locked and nothing was disturbed. In fact, the whole place looked as if no one had been up there in a long time. Lauren decided that from that day forwards, she wouldn't restock unless someone was in the building with her. In fact, she vowed not to stay in the keeper's house alone at all anymore. So who's walking around? No one really knows for sure. The Park Service frowns on discussing the ghost stories and investigations as they are not part of the official history. But Lauren likes to think that it may be the last keeper, Vernon Gaskill Sr., as when the light was automated, Vernon left for a job tending buoys. Admittedly, this was a more prestigious position, position, and it allowed him to spend more time with his family, including his granddaughter, Lauren. 
So family history there as well as book learning. Grandpa's stomping around upstairs as Lauren's tending the shop downstairs. There are worse ghosts to have in the shop that you're working in than your own grandfather. Absolutely. So, cheers to them. Graveyard of the Atlantic. Bum, bum, bum. Something chips. Here's a hint for next show. Something chips. Yes, we have picked a subject for next show. We'll get to that at the end, yes. though. All right, so the Outer Banks, of course, is known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic for a very good reason. More than a thousand ships have been lost to the shoals. Many lives have been lost. Um, it's due to this that Alexander Hamilton actually argued for the first lighthouse to be set up down um, in the Outer Banks. He, he argued for many more, but he got one for sure. Um, and we can thank him for our lighthouse system from that point onward. Thank you, Alex. Anyway, um, one particular ship uh, remained a mystery, as you might remember us discussing in our ghost ship episode. The schooner, the Carol A. Deering, was spotted by lightships uh, on January 29th of 1921, almost 100 years ago. Uh, with the crew visible but seeming to be sailing on a very peculiar course, on January 31st of the 1921, at 6.30 a.m., the ship was found abandoned on the shoals. Her lifeboats were missing, and rough seas prevented the Coast Guard from reaching the ship until February 4th. At this point, it was discovered that all person, personal belongings, key navigation equipment, important papers, and the ship's anchors were all missing. Several investigations were made, and some suspected pirates, rum-running gangsters, and mutiny, but there was no trace of the crew prologue or the equipment that had ever surfaced to this day and it remains a great mystery now the reason why we bring this up is you have to remember from that story that the only survivor found on board of that ship was a six-toed cat that was used to get rid of the bourbon on the ship the light keepers actually at Hatteras Lighthouse kept the cat and he um, was very busy there's a lot of his feline descendants at that my house to this day. So if anybody ever wants a six-toed cat, they need to go trap one at Hatteras. I'm not recommending you do that. Don't know if that's legal. Probably not. Details. And you can't get one from Aaron Hemingway's house either. They very much frown on that. That's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. Woo! <laughs> Been there. Didn't steal a cat. <laughs> Wanted to, but ben, I didn't ben, steal one. Been there, done that. We'll do it again. Yeah. Without stealing the cat, we'll just pet them. Anyway. Total tangent there. Back yes. on track. <laughs> so, I brought this up because the the King Hatteras Lighthouse actually has a ghost <clears throat> cat at it. And they think it was the cat that was uh, survived the Carol Deering. And um, it haunted the original lighthouse location. And then when they moved it, the cat moved with it. Uh, and uh, several of the, the shopkeepers at the lighthouse actually feed the cats or uh, are very friendly with the cats. And so they will, you know, have the feral cats around a lot. But they also will mention this ghost cat. Now, the ghost cat is a large black and white cat that is estimated to weigh anywhere from 20 to 25 pounds. He is a chunky boy. Chunky cat. Uh, he has been seen in and around the lighthouse for uh, over a hundred years, and when the lighthouse was moved from its previous location, the cat came along with it. Uh, many people claim the ghost cat will rub up against your legs. He will let you touch it. However, if you try to pick the feline up, the cat will vanish. Nobody knows when the cat first started appearing, but many locals, as I said, think it was either one of the former lightkeeper's cats or it was the uh, Carol Deering cat, and it has, well watched over the grounds for all of its nine lives. Uh, now, there was one fun story that I read um, uh, from Joe Sledge. Uh, he wrote one of the, the 13 stories of the uh, Outer Banks books, and he said he was on an investigation at the uh, Hatteras Lighthouse. They did have something go on in the lighthouse. I'm not going to get into that. But he said afterward, everybody was leaving to go and have, um, you know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. food at one of the diners down there as we normally do when we're done investigating and we're just all hungry. <laughs> and um, he said he would join them, but he wanted a few more minutes at the lighthouse alone just to take some pictures because it was a gorgeous uh, moonlit night. And as he was taking pictures, he felt a black and white cat come up and rub against his legs. He bent over, scratched it a few times, and then it went poof. 
Like, it just disappeared. And he's like, well, that's one to bring to the dinner table in a minute. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, local author had his own experience with it as well, and he's part of the paranormal investigation team down there, which I think is awesome. Um, oh, yeah, there's another ghost who's seen around the Hatter's Lighthouse. Uh, they have named him Bob. They uh, don't know if that's his real name, but that's what they're calling him. And he's said to be an old man wearing a yellow raincoat. He's been seen inside the lighthouse, outside on the nearby beach for many, many years. Uh, and they're not sure if he's actually attached as like a former keeper, but he does seem to be attached to the lighthouse grounds where it stands today. <laughs> so just a just a figure that seems that uh, I can I can see chilling at the Hatteras Lighthouse oh, for yeah. all eternity. I mean, if you have not been to the Hatteras Lighthouse, definitely go. And definitely go on one of the uh, park ranger talks. That was probably one of the best talks I have ever been at. Um, mm -hmm. The ranger that we had was talking about the time that they moved the lighthouse. And he takes you over to the rails that are still there. And he talks about the kid who actually suggests using soap to grease the railroad ties. Wasn't it, um... De Dove? dove? Yeah, yeah dove, dove, like soap. dove bar soap. Yeah, because there's, there was a hurricane coming in, and they had to move the sucker, and they had to move it fast. And so he actually piped up and said, well, what about using dove? Isn't that good for the environment? And, you know... What was it done? I don't know. No, it was it dove. Was a, it was it dove was a bar, bar soap. It was a bar soap. Um, and dove is pure soap, so it wasn't bad for the environment. Yeah. Uh, and they researched it very quickly and got the approval and they used it and that's what they used to grease the, the tracks to move the lighthouse quickly. Well, as quick as you can move a lighthouse they moved that big. A, they moved it <laughs> at a pretty good clip. It's yeah. just, it was amazing. And, and of course in the ranger station there you can mm -hmm. go in and you can see the video and that's the, they have like a 10-15 minute video yeah. on moving the lighthouse. and Definitely worth going to. <clears throat> the climb is incredible. If you have weak knees like me, you're going to get wobbly on the way down. You're going to get wobbly on the way up. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, but yeah, beautiful. Definitely worth going to. Um, so we're going to talk about an old um, sh uh, ca sea captain's uh, kind of club. It's known as the Hammock House and the duel that took place there. Yep. Now this is in Beaufort. So it is... Not Beaufort. Don't get them confused. <clears throat> Beaufort's before you get to the Outer Banks. We, we are kind of cheating just a little bit because this is technically on the shore side. It's on the mainland um, of the Outer Banks. But it was Banks. an awesome story. It's so a great story. To... and a Great story. And it, it's close enough. Mm -hmm. It's close enough. It's part of the, the, the banks. Yeah. But, yeah. So, the duel at Hammock House. During the late 1600s, the coastal sediment of Beaufort Town was already an established port. Many coastal sailing vessels made use of the fine, safe harbor as a regular port of call. To safely enter the harbor, one had to take sight bearings on a large hammock, or knoll, not a hammock, not like a chilling out, relaxing on the beach mm. hammock, a hammock. Spelled the same way, but two different words. It's, it's a rise in this yeah. case, which was the dominant piece of high ground on the shore. When the skipper has an unobstructed view on the hammock from outside the inlet, he could safely set course directly for it and sail safely past the shoals. Today, on that same knoll, stands Hammock House, a beautiful house built by a group of owner captains who regularly came to port in Beaufort. It served as a sort of club and home away from home for each of these men of the sea. Records indicate the house was already built and in use by 1703. So this is a very old house. Yes. Each of the owner captains bought, um, brought in supplies to build the house. The original build date is unknown. No expense was spared when building the graceful three-story structure with large chimneys at each end, a fireplace in every room, and deep shady porches on the first and second floors. A pier was built less than 20 feet from the front of the house for the, for the pulling boats to moor uh, pulling boats to moor, and a driveway for coaches to circle around to at the rear of the house. Many sought to have a membership to Hammock House, but admission was by in invitation only. So it was very, very exclusive. Yes. It was the height of luxury and elegance of the day, with a succession of balls and other lavish entertainments. It was at one of these balls that tragedy struck and has forever seeped into the floors at Hammock House. 
One of the owner captains of Hammock House was an ambitious young captain named Madison Brothers. He was known as a hard-driving and demanding captain who had worked his way up from cabin boy to owner of his very own vessel. Brothers was an excellent seaman and good businessman, but he had one very serious flaw, an unforgivable temper, or ungovernable temper. Mm -hmm. You don't want to take this guy off. In fits of rage, especially when drinking, people took care not to provoke him. It was said, very quietly, that he had killed more than once in anger, but always in a fair fight. Details. Soon his name began to be shortened, and he was called Captain Mad Brothers. Because what's a pirate without a good name? But he wasn't a pirate. How do you know? Details. <laughs> Details that I don't have here right in front of me right now. <laughs> he could Anyways. have been a pirate. Anyways. He was a good businessman. <laughs> Captain Mad did show a gentler side when he chose, and was able to woo and win the hand of a beautiful young Baltimore lady named Samantha Ashby. Although there was a considerable age difference, Captain Brothers convinced Samantha of his sincerity and plans for the wedding began. Samantha would travel down to Hammock House via carriage, and Captain Brothers would sail his vessel down. After the wedding, they would leave on his ship to cruise the British West Indies. They left at the same time, and the coach made good time despite the dusty, rutted post roads. Not so much for Captain Brothers. One day out, his first mate became very ill and was beyond the help of the medicine chest on board. They had to turn around and return to port in Baltimore. After getting the first mate to the hospital, Captain Brother set sail two days behind schedule and shorthanded. His luck just got worse from there. A sudden violent squall brought the foremast down in a tangle of rigging and stays. The storm just continued to worsen and Captain Brothers began to think the devil was waiting for him on the other side. While well, Samantha and her escort arrived at Hammock House on time and welcomed in, and welcomed in grand style, none of the newcomers had ever been to Hammock House and they were not disappointed. Several sea captains and their wives were in residence at the time and they decided to throw a formal dance for the guests. No word had arrived from Captain Brothers by this point and many believed he had just been delayed by the weather, thus the effort to entertain the guests with a formal dance. To Samantha's great surprise, the officers from several of the ships moored in town were invited to the dance, and this included her brother, Lieutenant Carruthers Ashby, an officer on the HMS Diligent. It was a joyous and unexpected reunion for both of them. Mail being unreliable in those days, Samantha did not know where he was located, and thus he did not know of her engagement. She was overjoyed that he would be able to attend the wedding. For the next several days, Lieutenant Ashby came to Hammock House every afternoon to see his sister, and they took long walks about Beaufort Town and brought each other up to date on what had been happening in their lives. Their parents had died while they were young, and so their bond was strong. During these days, Samantha started to worry about the safety of her fiancé, but her brother was able to help ease her fears. Captain Brothers was limping towards Beaufort Town with makeshift rigging, and he was in quite a rage due to the delays. He had already vented his temper on crew twice by flogging two men. He had been drinking steadily for two days when they finally rounded Cape Lookout and turned towards Beaufort Harbor. As the inlet opened in front of him, he gazed through his telescope towards Hammock House. To his surprise, he saw a gay party was underway, with no concerns showing that the bridegroom was not present. This inflamed his temper even more, and, <clears throat> and he became suspicious of everyone in Hammock House. He ordered the captain's gig to be lowered, boarded it with his heavily armed crew, and his crew learned early on to prepare for anything when you serve under Captain Mad Brothers. Especially when he's angry and drinking. <laughs> As brothers walked up to the house, he spied his betrothed walking arm in arm with a young man who bent down to kiss her on the cheek. He had no idea that this was her brother, nor did he stop to ask. Betrayed, he screamed, and he attacked Lieutenant Ashby with his cut glass. Lieutenant Ashby was armed with an epe, which was a dueling sword, and even though he was skilled with it, Captain Brothers' rage could not be penetrated. Other members tried to stop them as the duel moved into the ballroom, but they were cut off by Captain Brother's crew members. They stated it was a matter of honor. On the duel went up two flights of stairs, Lieutenant Ashby being backed up them until he had no more room. He then went on the offensive, trying to use the additional height he had to his advantage. He lunged, slipped, 
and brother, seeing an opening, took, his, took out his hip knife and buried it to the hilt in Ashby's chest. Ashby fell onto brothers, causing them both to fall down the stairs. Brothers disentangled himself from Ashby and, under the cover of his heavily armed men, made it back to his ship. He sailed out to sea, and no attempt was made to stop him. Lieutenant Ashby was given the best medical care by his ship's surgeon and the local doctors, but they were unable to save him. He died in Hammock House that night. Lieutenant Ashby made one final request, and that was to be buried standing upright in his full-dress uniform, facing southward towards Buford Inlet. His request was carried out. There is no record of Captain Brothers ever being punished for the murder of Lieutenant Ashby. Hammock House still stands today, and if you were to go inside, you would find the bloodstains on the upper floors where Lieutenant Ashby fell. They are particularly noticeable when the weather becomes foggy and damp. The sounds of laughter and sweet music still come and go, and on occasion one can hear the clamor of a sword battle echoing through the ballroom and up the stairs to the third floor. Another place I would love to go investigate. Clang, 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 clang. I mean, ghostly sword fight, why not? Sounds, <laughs> Stay out of its way. It sounds pretty epic. Yep. Plus, it sounds like an awesome house. Yeah. Road trip. Road trip. How many times do we say that during the show? A lot. A lot. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Huh? Oh, any questions? Uh, nope, no, no questions. Okay. I always like to check. Ooh, I make time to read. Well, late show behind me. Good thing you're just asleep. Facing the other way, at least. Yeah, I think she's trying to sleep. Trying. We're just here making a lot of noise. Yes. All right, so we're moving back to Frisco. Uh, so back on the islands, uh, and we're going to talk about the Cora tree. Now, in the 1700s, a woman named Cora, along with her baby, took up residence in a small home in modern-day Snug Harbor uh, Drive in Frisco. No one knew where they came from. She wasn't related to anybody on the island, and there was a lot of suspicion about the woman early on, especially considering she stayed to herself. After a while, it seemed that Cora was always around when some sort of misfortune struck. Misfortunes such as fishermen being able to catch any fish or a cow going dry that she had just touched. Then things just went from bad to worse. Now, People often thought she had some sort of elemental magic or something along those lines, and so they would often leave a penny or a coin on her dock when they wanted good weather for their fishing. Some people thought it was luck, some people were hedging their bets, and she would go out and perform a ritual after she got these coins. She never asked for them, she never accepted any charity, but if the coin was left on her dock, she would take it. Um, now, when things went from bad to worse was when Captain Eli Blood from Salem, Massachusetts, and his brig, the Susan G., ran into trouble on the local waters. Uh, he ended up beaching on the waters. His men set up tents. Uh, they had drunken dancing parties there every single night. But as a captain, he was actually offered a room in town with one of the local uh, men. And when he was in town, he actually started to hear the tales of the strange woman named Cora, and she was, he started suspecting that she was a witch, and being from Salem, oh, that's not good. So uh, he started to talk about that she should be dealt with. Then one day, a young, uh, body of a young man actually washed up on the beach, and supposedly a small female like footprints were actually found leading away from the body. Some say that the number 666 was actually burned into his forehead, but there's no documented evidence of that. That's kind of a rumor. As well. Yeah. Just about anything related to Salem, Massachusetts about that time. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, Captain Blood, actually decided that he was going to just take manners into his own hands, and he went out and he captured Cora and subjected her to the three telltale tests of a potential witch. Whether or not she could float in water, which we know doesn't work. Uh, whether or not a knife could cut her hair. And uh, a peculiar exercise of mixing the blood of several men in a bowl for clarification of guilt. I'm just going to leave it there. Don't get me started. Cora failed all of these tests and was deemed to be a witch uh, by Captain Blood. And so she and the baby were tied up to a tree and he was going to burn them to death. Uh, luckily, Captain Tom Smith, who uh, saw this as complete and total madness... 
detested the, this fake guilty verdict, and he demanded that Corey be tried in a real court. Uh, at that point in time, with the distraction, unfortunately, um, the baby actually suddenly changed and shape-shifted into a black furry cat and darted away. Upon seeing this, Captain Blood immediately rushed up with his torch and lit the fire. Um, and uh, as he was doing this, a lightning bolt actually struck it and lit it for him. Hmm. Kind of odd. Anyway, um, as the smoke cleared, Blood saw that Cora had vanished in her, the, in her place. Uh, the letters C-O-R-A were scorched deep into the tree that she had been uh, tied to. Although Cora was never seen again, the letters are still visible on that same tree today. Uh, there was a road that eventually that was installed, and the town split the lanes into two parts around the famous tree so they wouldn't have to tear it down. Uh, this was actually features on Travel Channel's Monumental Mysteries. I don't think we ever saw that. We must episode. have missed that episode. So we might have to see if we can look it up on, on the internet. I didn't think we missed a single episode of that I show. I know, we love that show. Yes. I kind of miss it since we canceled the cable. Yeah. Hmm. But I'm not quite willing to go back to cable. Not, not for the price. Yeah, we're saving like what, $120 a month. Yeah. Yeah. Cut the cord it, almost a year ago. A year no. ago in February. It was just this past February. Yeah, a year ago in this coming February. It's, it was It'll like, be a year. Just, just say six months ago. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I apparently don't need any more wine, but I'm still going to drink. That's all right. Because, you know. Um, so but now we're going to jump over to the last island, Ocracoke, which is the one that Chris and I would love to go back to. And some of these stories, we of course talked about Blackbeard the last time that we did beaches because on Ocracoke is uh, Teach's Hole, and that is the famous space where you can sometimes see Blackbeard swimming in the water or hearing him call out because that was where he was supposedly killed and beheaded. Yeah, there's there's stories of people seeing Blackbeard all over Ocracoke yeah, Island. It was his island. It was. So, and, and he's basically, he is the linchpin of much of Ocracoke's folklore. So, uh, yeah, you, you hear about him all over the place. And anytime there's any kind of spirit with a uh, bushy, dark beard, it's it's, it's Blackbeard. Blackbeard. That, it doesn't have to be flaming, it's just Blackbeard. Yep. So... It almost seems fitting that the most isolated town in North Carolina is perhaps almost the most haunted, perhaps it also its most haunted town. The small sliver, sliver of land is only accessible by ferry, boat, or plane, and maintains the same solitude of its early days. Yet beneath the live oaks, marshland, tide forests, and beautiful beaches is something much darker. The lingering history of Ocracoke, from Blackbeard and his pirates to generations of families inhabiting the island, has created quite a hotbed for paranormal activity. Now, Ocracoke is the southernmost island on the Cape Hatteras National Seashore. The island is just 9.6 miles long and only has a few major roads, with one of them being the two-lane North Carolina 12. Once you get off the ferry, you, became, you become very much aware that you have entered an otherworldly, isolated place. As you watch the ferry pull away and slowly feel the energy of all the history of the island start to encapsulate you. Once you find your way into Ocracoke, you'll find a location at 25 Lighthouse Road that is full of history. It was originally built uh, in 1901, and it was primarily a schoolhouse on the lower floor, and the upper floor was used as a meeting place for an Odd Fellows Lodge. By 1917, a new schoolhouse was built, and the old lodge was disbanded and sold to a pri as a private residence. Fast forward to World War II. A naval station was built nearby, and naval officers stayed in the upstairs section of the lodge during that time. After World War II... Side wings were added to the structure to create the first modern, use that term kind of loosely, hotel on the island. On Saturday nights, it became a social hub to let the good times flow on the island. Most recently, the building was used as the Island Inn, which closed just a few short years ago. It is now owned by the Ocracoke Preservation Society that is working to restore it to its original appearance. With so much history, there was one... One certain ghost there that is so famous she is known by name, Mrs. Godfrey. 
In the building's days as a lodge, she would take a, take a pension to rearranging women's makeup bags, and while she's a pretty timid spirit, there have been reports of visitors claiming that she has sat down on their beds, or they have felt her presence like a hand on the foot. I can't read your foot. No, you can't. Nobody like my foot. That's all right. That, that, that works. Hand <laughs> on the foot. The innkeepers were even known to honor some room change requests in, in, um, as uh, Miss Godfrey made a number of guests feel uncomfortable over the years. Despite the fact that the building is no longer an inn, residents of Ocracoke have no doubt that Mrs. Godfrey will continue to look over the structure in the days to come. I'd be really curious to see what happens when they restore it to what it originally was and what she starts to do next. Yeah, it's going to be hard to say because the... Um, the first part of the restoration is they actually tore down the wings that were added. Yeah. So it's it's back to the original structure. Those post World War II wings are gone now, and from what I understand, from what I read, it's in the midst of this restoration. Yeah. So. So I wonder if she's uh, making her not so happy choices known. It depends on where she originated from. Yeah. But was, was she a spirit of the schoolhouse? Of the schoolhouse in the earliest days was she a spirit of the actual lodge post World War II? With, where she would have known it as the building with the wings. Yeah. So is it getting restored to something she knew, or is it getting taken away from her? Another place to investigate. Yes. Ah, so, moving down. Uh, well, beautiful by day, Springer's Point Nature Preserve is haunting at night. Some even refuse to enter as they've encountered the spirit of a large bearded man, and one even claims to have been chased by the ghost. Springer's Point is the site where notorious pirate Blackbeard and ochre, or pirate back Blackbeard and ochre coat enthusiast, of course, threw a party for his fellow pirates. They roasted a whole hog, drank, sang, and danced. It was said to have been one of the largest ever gatherings of pirates, and the party lasted for days. Only shortly after this feast, Blackbeard was beheaded off the coast. Some wonder if the large bearded ghost is perhaps Blackbeard himself. Yep. And as we said, shortly after he was beheaded, he started to haunt Teach's Hole uh, that we talked about before. So. Yep. So. Ooh, let's see. Then we have the story of Fanny Pearl McWilliams. So aside from the pirates, Ocracoke is home to 81 cemeteries. There's not a lot of space in Ocracoke, so I'm really curious about all these cemeteries. Yeah, you... you we visited the one that was World War II one. Yes, which that was the one that actually the the Ger yeah. the the German U two mm -hmm. or U two U boat. Yeah. Might have had a little of a drink. Anyways, moving on. Yeah, moving on. Um, but yes, there's actually eighty one cemeteries. Now, with that said, the they are family plots. Many, many of them are small family plots, and so some markers have all but washed away into the harsh realities of the coastal landscape. One of these cemeteries is near a cottage on Lighthouse Road, where the headstones from two toddlers are barely standing, but are a sacred reminder of the hauntings and histories of this place. There's also a community cemetery in Sunset Village, where the ghosts of an elderly couple have been spotted wearing 19th century attire. Today, certain gravestones have been marked with no trespassing signs by families of the deceased to discourage tourists from trying to recreate their own paranormal experience. So is the case with the headstone of Fanny Pearl McWilliams. Legend has it, Fanny had a dream one night, her token of death, where she saw herself in a white coffin in a white sailboat beneath a full moon. She died the very next night, and the dream, unbeknownst to her husband, became reality when he placed her in a white casket on a white skiff that sailed across Cockle Creek. And yes, there was a full moon. Premonitions. Mm -hmm. I had a few of those here. Yep, yeah, mostly related to uh, the, um, the theater fire. Yep, yeah, the Richmond Theater fire. Uh, All right, uh, moving on to the last lighthouse. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the last lighthouse. Not, which which is really small. It is. It's it cute. Is. It's a cute lighthouse. Ocracoke Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. None of these lighthouses we talked about in our actual haunted lighthouses episode. Yeah. No, I don't know how we did that. Carefully. We managed somehow. Carefully. There was no care taken. Dumb luck. There's a lot of lighthouses to talk about that are haunted. Dumb luck. So, moving on. Ocracoke <laughs> Light is the second longest operating lighthouse in the United States, and some of Ocracoke's most famous ghosts have been spotted in the area. A very pretty girl in a light blue long dress has also been seen in the vicinity of the lighthouse. 
No one has ever been able to figure out who she is, but she is quite often seen walking after an evening summer thunderstorm has ended, and she has even waved and talked to some people, but she quite often simply vanishes, and people are left there scratching their head, wondering where the pretty girl went to. It is said she has dark hair and olive skin and a beautiful smile. Some people say she makes comments about the party that night. When they start to question her about what party that night she vanishes, some people have claimed to see her with a lantern. Then there's the story of Theodosia Burr Alliston. Well, Alliston. of course, we, we talked about her yes. before, but she's also seen around this lighthouse. They think it's her, at least. Yeah. Possibility. She was the beloved daughter of the notorious Aaron Burr, and, but she lost her life when the ship that she was on sank off the coast of the Outer Banks. She appears in the vicinity of the lighthouse with a long white dress and her hair dripping wet, sometimes with seaweed in it. You know if you know she's near if you catch a whiff of a strong, musty smell. Last but not least, there's the old light keeper, lighthouse keeper adorned in black and gray, striped pants, and a white shirt. His long hair is often tied with a black string and he has a full, large beard. The strangest part about this particular ghost is that he's rumored to walk straight through people up until that point he appears as a solid, living, breathing person. There's no concrete answer as to why some ghosts continue to continuously wander the area in which they met their demise. Maybe their souls are damned to the area forever, but maybe they prefer to call this coastal stretch of land home. Either way, for such a small, isolated place, Ocracoke indeed has some of the most interesting hauntings of the entire state. Cheers. Cheers. Probably a good time, because I am... I don't know what the alcohol content, content is on that, but... Whew! Um, it's kind of feeling it, so sorry if I'm stumbling and slurring a little bit, folks. <laughs> Very good, though. White yeah. mint, six bucks. Nice and refreshing. Was this one six bucks? Yeah, 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 yeah. this one was six bucks. Very nice. So, Sandrea Wine Mojito is what it's called. That's not a Sandrea. Uh, okay, so. 81? 81. Yeah, 81. Oh, yeah, 81 <laughs> cemeteries, yes. Yeah, it, that that number came from the official Ocracoke website, right? Yep. So, yeah. Now, again, granted, 81, that could yeah. include something as small as a simple family plot for, in one case, as I mentioned, the two toddlers. Yeah. Um, but yeah. But that's a lot of cemeteries in one area. Yeah. Um, it, I, well, I mean, it's been there, an area there for, uh, people have lived there for a long time. It's very isolated. And I guess when somebody passed away, you just buried them wherever you could. Nothing wrong with the economical vino. <laughs> yeah, I'd be surprised how often a $5 or $6 bottle of wine is really good. Let's so, see. We're checking out last minute questions, make sure we answer them all. Patrick doesn't. Uh, ding us for ditching cable. It's expensive. Yes. It it's says, so much cheaper. <laughs> uh, gray man protected my apartment. Tornado passed my apartment. My neighbors lost over 20 trees. Luckily had no damage. That's right. Wow. The, I guess Glenn... Cheers, you, Glenn. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> that, I guess uh, you must have gotten maybe the worst of the, um, the, hurricane, the hurricane. That, that basically was... It was a like a non-event here in Richmond, but yeah, I know... But further north and east of us got nailed. Yeah, it was pretty rough. So, i um, glad that you, um, glad that you came out on, uh, the okay end of it and that you were doing all right. And, uh, thank you for sending... Mm, excuse me. <laughs> thank you for sending, uh, uh, Glenn did an investigation just this past weekend with some people at, um... Belgrove Plantation. Plantation. Yeah, and he, they caught something on camera, which was really cool to look at. Yeah, and uh, so. the, I think that, that picture was on the Belgrove Plantation... Page. Page. Yeah, Black Pel Belgrove Plantation investigation page. Yeah. So, yeah, Glenn, thanks for pointing that out. That was a really yeah. cool picture. Uh, as far as things that we're doing coming up, we're going to be at Fleetwood Paracon in uh, September, on September 26th, so get your tickets for that. Uh, if you go the night before and buy tickets, I think they're $15, you can do an investigation of the church the night before, and there's another investigation that includes the church in two places on the battlefield. Yeah. Uh, so check out their Facebook page, also Transcend Paranormal. They're one of the sponsors, so you can check out their page as well. They're posting the stuff hosts. about it. Yeah. They're one of the hosts. So um, we're, we're just going to be there as, as vendors. As lowly vendors this time, but hanging out with our paranormal peeps, so cheers to that. Yeah. 
So we're looking forward to that. Um, the tours are going every weekend, yep. Wednesday, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So definitely come on, check us out. That's our schedule through the end of September. September. Come October, we are going to be going Thursday through Sunday. Yep, and then. Um, and our full October schedule is posted on it, our website. It now. is live. Uh, we will be doing um, private tours as well, so if you're interested in a private tour, group of six, um, definitely email us, give us a call, and we will set you up with that. And those are not going to be available Friday, Saturday, so the rest of the week we'll be able to schedule them, but not Friday, Saturday. Too many tours already scheduled those two days. Yep. Busy, busy, busy. <laughs> Alex, somehow I manage Michael Scott. I'll have to look that up. Sorry, Alex, you're, you're, maybe it's just the The wine the, the is vino. definitely not. A light in 2020. Yes, oh yes, a light in 2020. Yes, so you are looking forward to. Uh, oh, uh oh. My computer's giving me some issues. Oh dear. Uh, streaming is. Oh, yes. Yep, and yeah, yep, Glenn took, Glenn took that picture that he shared from Bell Grove. Yeah, so that was a great picture. And, uh, oh, um, yeah, two weeks. So um, we do have a subject for two weeks from now. And uh, we're going to be doing a uh, Spirits of the Great Lakes. Yes. Or, uh, uh, so I'm going to be looking at ghost ships and other spirits up there. Um, and, you know, just dive up to another water-bound One area. more, more water-bound tales. Although, I mean, it'll be... Waterbound and of course the the ports that yep. surround uh, the Great Lakes too, because the Great Lakes is in its own right quite the um, massive, ma well, and massive, quite the and graveyard, quite the uh, ship graveyard. Yeah, many 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 ships have been lost up there over the centuries. Yeah, so I'm going to dive mm. into those tales. I have five books to read between now and then and to write. That's a lot of books. Yep, but we'll be back in two weeks with that. So we are looking forward to that. Um, I'm gonna go get you know real quick. Oh yes, snag her. She was actually. She was very good tonight. Very good. Mm -hmm. I know. Oh, so sleepy. So sleepy. <laughs> yep, Patrick's excited. He likes the ghost ships ones. So sleepy. We're excited too. Okay, flat back down. So yeah. Oh, big <laughs> yawn. Okay, go back to sleep right here. Go sleep right there. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, but yes, okay. so we're gonna we're gonna do some more ghost ships and focus solely on the seaway and thank my mommy in law <laughs> for letting lending me those books. <laughs> so, oh, Glenn will be watching in two weeks. Uh, Teresa, thank you, thank you for thank you for watching. Everybody, thank you for watching. Yes, yes. So, thank you for keeping us sane and for giving me a purpose to research and dive elsewhere. We have, storytelling. we have had so much fun doing this. We love this. And no, you know, you are not allowed to type in response. Is she she already did that on my work computer. One she day. locked him out one day. Uh, she locked me out twice that day, but she also got in, uh, jumped on my keyboard during an instant message session with one of my coworkers, and uh, managed to send a bunch of gobbledygook. <laughs> you didn't tell me about that. I didn't. No. Yeah, I had to promptly respond back. It's like that was my cat. <laughs> She also did one of the paws from behind the screen over the camera while he was in the middle of an interview. Um, so yeah, she's his his coworkers have been quite amused by her as well. <laughs> Alex, looking for oh she's gonna loop in her Great Lakes pals. Oh, definitely. Thank cool. you, Alex. Yeah. And yeah, well, thank you for the promotion. I still have to share tonight. We greatly yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. So definitely, feel free to share us and this stuff. Let us know about stories. I mean, we, we definitely always look for new things to, to go and play with. Please send me down a Pinterest rabbit hole of research. Not that I need an excuse, but direction's always <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, there are true bright spots. Oh, thank you. So. Thank you, everybody. Yes. I'm flattered. Thank I'm, you so much. I don't know if I'm blushing or if it's the alcohol. <laughs> it's probably or, both. Or both. <laughs> But we've had a lot of fun doing this, yeah. so we will. So we're gonna keep doing it. We're gonna keep doing it, and uh, yes, thank you guys. Yeah. And with that, as as always, yes. if uh, if there's anything in the the next couple of weeks, drop us a note anytime. We uh, we we love to love to chat with you guys. So we're we're always here. Mm -hmm. Send us a note, and uh, happy to happy to chat with you. All the all the paranormal yes. stuffs. 
and happy to host you if you come to Richmond. You never be, uh, never will know when we're going to catch something. We actually caught something on our Churchill tour this past Saturday. Yes, so got an interesting picture on the tour this past we're, Saturday. We're, we may have discovered a new ghost. Yep, we're still vetting it, so we haven't shared it yet. But once we um, kind of get through it a little more, we'll, if it's uh, something that's maybe, you know, unexplainable, we'll maybe get around to sharing it. Yep, so we always like to check things out and, you know, Kind of proof them first before yes. we we share them but we're in the process of doing that and it's starting to look a little more prob probable mm -hmm. so uh so maybe something to look forward to in this next few weeks <laughs> and with that we are going to head on out let's check on any questions uh no questions everybody's saying how cute your net is and thanking us for doing the live stream yes. so that's blushing that's blushing are. Blessing, blessing. Thank blessing. you so much. And if you want, if you want more Yuna and not necessarily her her butthole, um, <laughs> yeah, again, you can follow her on Instagram. She has her own Instagram, Fuzzy Murder Muffin. Yeah. All one word. So. Because that's what she is. Yes. All right. And you wouldn't that, know it right now, but yes. With that, we will say good night. Cheers, y'all, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye.